This is where the era changed. A lot of people with art will argue with me because of it, but when you look at it properly, it, it is the way it happened. Laurie, Joe and Mick were lifesavers under the regimented scheme. They were surfers, bloody oath they were surfers. They were most probably surfers and then lifesavers. But when we came along, not saying we're heroes or bullshit or just, you know, pat myself on the back, but when we come along, we had, we created a totally new lifestyle. We created a surfing lifestyle that carried on to today where people want to go, Jesus, you know, I just want to go surfing, shape surfboards. And that is where it all actually started as far as I'm concerned. Sydney was most probably ahead of us, but when you look at the Gold Coast and, and Queensland as, as a whole, these few people instigated the brilliance, you know, Joe Larkin, Mick Carey and Laurie started the actual throng on the heart and the soul and all the rest of it. But we created that other little bit that has carried it when, on. When it's time to land the Barracuda! Yeah! G'day viewers, today's podcast was brought to you by Koala Karma, the chill out drink. Just sit back, relax, have a can of cup, cup, Karma Koala, and just chill out man, and just tuck into a tasty barrel bro. Today, oh I love this episode, talking to Tony Dempsey, TD, um, uh, old school, um, 60s and beyond shaper and a legendary uh, piece of uh, surfing history. Yeah, he would say, oh, just Gold Coast, Queensland surfing. No, mate, worldwide. A lot of our, a lot of the, um, uh, uh, you know when you meet someone uh, from certain eras that will never be restarted again, like surfing, you know, uh, you could argue that it really took off, um, you know. Anyway, listen to me going on about something that's going to be in this episode. I, I just want to say these words that I always think about when I'm in the water. That, um, and I don't know who first came up with it, but only a surfer knows the feeling. Are you there, Tony Dempsey? Ow! How are you, Drew? Great, Tony Dempsey. What are you doing, champion? Oh, matey, just at the moment, uh, I'm sort of at the end of my professional role as a shaper. Um, after 50 years, starting back in 1963, when I first shaped my first surfboard on the Gold Coast here, up at my parents' place in Fernie Avenue surface, so that makes me a pretty near local. <laughs> matey, yeah, during the period of time that I've spent shaping, it's one of those things that every person sort of has an end of the line. The journey has been fantastic. The destination is there. So with the things that are happening around in surfing at the moment, when you're a personality person like myself, you have uh, an obligation to sort of go, well, that's my time. It's the same as a really good footballer or professional surfer or anything else like that. Being a totally hand-shaped surface shaper um, and getting, you know, like I'm 68 years old now and when you look at it, you know, it was taking me a day and a half to make a, a shaped surfboard and then take it down, get a glass. The actual monetary system wasn't fair enough on my behalf to actually enjoy the business of surfboard shaping. Um, the, the love of shaping will always be there. I'll still have to find a little shaping bay. I closed my shaping bay down the other day, which, you know, it breaks your heart. Wow. But it's one of those things that you've got to do every now and again. How old was that, sh that particular shaping bay? Uh, 15 years. Oh. I was in there for 15 years and uh, doing BSC, which is Burley Shaping Company, uh, not the BSC, which is the, <laughs> you know, health food stuff. <laughs> 
And, They're across uh, the street. Yeah, I know. I just, <laughs> I just saw them. I just saw them and I've right. gone, oh, geez, that's reminiscing, you know. So yeah, well. Anyway, it's one of those things that you've got to come up with. And when you look at the actual journey, uh, there's never been a monetary value that you can actually put on it because what I find that I tried to achieve right back in those early days of the 60s, it was a lifestyle. So when you look at a lifestyle, you don't look at the monetary value of it. And when it all turns around and starts working for you, it's worth more than money. You know, you've got like a, oh, some of the different surfing experiences I had, like 63, 64, I went to one of the first Bells contests. Like, man, going from here to Bells in those days... People can't understand the actual value of travel. Like, we had to go across ferries at the Richmond River and all this sort of stuff, you know? Like, they don't understand that sort no. of crap today. And it was like travel. And, and the unknown of the deep water. Oh. Right? Uh, oh. Like, uh, before you guys arrived on boards, you had fishermen with tales of sharks, I'm sh no doubt. That's oh. all they knew. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah? Oh, mate. We, we got to Bells and... Mate, it was huge. In those days, there was no wetsuits. Wow. Can you imagine going down there? I've done it once without a wetsuit. Freezing, your, yeah. freezing your freezers off and going, bullshit, how big is this? But how beautiful was the actual arena of Bells? Yeah. I've always thought Burley had one of the most unique arenas for surfing. But bloody hell, you go to Bells and see that lineup coming through. Oh, God, your heart just explodes and, you know, you meet different people. Peter Troy I met down there. Unfortunately, Peter's RIP, one of the greatest travel surfers, historians in the world of surfing. And all these people are actually passing on now. And I've just seen there's a couple of really good, beautiful Hawaiian people that have passed on and there's a heap of, you know, to actually get this on, on tape... And a little bit of history of, of, a, of a, a Queensland or a Gold Coaster that we can actually, you know, have a bit of a giggle over and go, oh, bullshit, that was pretty cool in those days. Yeah. But travelling down there, we were one of the first crew to actually go to Angari. We weren't the first crew to surf it because Bob Evans and all that crew were there before. But my auntie lived at Angari and... Um, She's, oh, the, my uncle's turned around and gone, oh, you know, come out and I'll show you what it's like, you know, because I heard of this surfing point that was there. I surfed the local beach when I was young. And anyway, he drove us out there in his old landy. And we, you know, it was mud and shit and crap. We got there and it was only about two or three foot and I've just gone, look at this, this is just bullshit, you know. Like, okay. These are the things that money can't buy. And the experiences of... Doing things like that had a, an adrenaline pump that no drug in the world would ever, ever, you know, it would never be created to create it, you know. And, and it, what blows my mind is that, um, you know, you're at the start of something that will never end. You know, you know what I mean? Like it, surfing, uh, you, you're at the start of all that. Like uh, surfing will absolutely never end. And you were there for that, that whole unfolding of the, the, you know, the long board to the short board era, finding spots and it becoming a culture. Uh, yeah, well, like yeah, I, I told yeah. you on the phone the other day, I, I mm. saw this thing um, about surfing, but it really highlighted to me how um, what Aussies thought of them, or the way Aussies thought of themselves after the war, it was a lot, we were, we were based around RSL clubs yeah, and, and very surf clubs. But very regimented. Regimented. Very and, yeah, yeah. and we were known to be country... Country in war, almost, or, yeah. or you know, to be to be like a, a country sort of person. Yeah. But then you guys came along and created the other culture that we know now, the beach culture. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There, Which there, is everything. Yeah. To there us. was a term. Uh, there was a turning point in that time period. Like there was a beach cult culture prior to us that rode all the big wooden boards and all this sort of stuff, which I actually did and appreciated because I. I Back in the early days when I was 10, I used to do my swim coaching at Seabreeze 
uh, pool. It, it, it was a huge, big thing behind the Life Saving Club in at, surface. at surface. And I was a cadet at surface in those days. And, you know, these things eventuated. A guy came up from Sydney and he had a, an actual bolster ball. And we've gone, bloody hell, you know, like, this is freaky because they've gone from the actual wooden ply boards to the wooden ply Malibu boards, which we played with, you know, and then all of a sudden these dudes come up with this outrageous modern, I think it was, it could have been one of the ones that the guys come out for the uh, big thing in, in, oh, you know, when Greg oh, Knoll and all those guys yeah, come out. Yeah. I can't remember what they come out for. I think it was an Olympic swimming or yes, some huge, story, yeah. huge thing. And, uh, yeah, he, I think he might have bought it in Sydney at that period of time. But, yeah, you know, you'd sort of clamber around. You're a grotty little grommet dickhead going, oh, can I have a go on it? Can I have a go on it? Yeah, piss off, kid, you know. Right. <laughs> Sorry about that. But they'd go, yeah, bugger off, you know. Anyway, yeah, eventually. Explain it to him, like, because yeah. it's the way they could turn the board. Oh, they could... the manoeuvrability, yeah. like the long boards, the big toothpicks, that, which were called, you'd go straight in or you could actually slightly angle them. There was no, there was a slight little rudder affair on them. But this thing, you could actually, well, they were classified as bolts of hot dog boards. Right, you, you could know? hold them, right. Uh, was it a two-person with those big old... Uh... You know, the ones became before the bolsa. Was it two people that were hanging on those boards? Oh, mate, really... when, you, when you were young, you had to have three or four guys to actually walk down the beach with them. I Crazy. think they were about 70 pounds, you know, and <laughs> freaky. But anyway, yeah. moving along, you know, it was all a part of the history of the Gold Coast and what we knew, what was happening. And then we'd get the surf movies. The surf movies were the thing that kicked us on. You know, the early surf movies with Mickey Dora and all these guys and these guys surfing huge, massive waves in Hawaii, Greg Knoll and all these dudes. And you sort of go, bullshit, you know, like we surf Burley and you, you never... Our, our adventure point at that time was going down to Burley and trying to get somebody who had a ute or a something or a truck to throw you big old pieces of crap on and go and surf Burley, but you never surfed inside Burley, you never surfed the cove. It was just right near the old, what it was, it was skating ring. It was an original skating ring and then they turned it into a pool. Wow. And it got destroyed in, I can't remember what year, a huge cyclone, cyclone come through and washed it all out to sea, so wow. yeah. And you never had a leg rope, so you just surfed a little end bit of it because it was all, always perfect because there was so much sand there. And in, the, in those early days, when you were surfing, say, Surface Paradise, you would actually have a bank, a, an actual surfing bank that would last six or seven weeks, right through the Chrissy holidays. And we put it down to, this is a bit environmental stuff, if that goes anywhere, uh, all the sand mining, it used to take all the heavy metals out of the sand, and therefore our sand banks don't last as long and all this sort of crap. So... These days you might get a bank there that might last a week and then a bit of swell will come through and it'll blow it away and then it'll have to come back again. But in those days, surface was a really regulated place for some of the top surfers Isn't around. interesting now? Oh, it, it, it moves, it moves. Like to go down to Cool and Gatto and surf Snapper and Greenmount was, it, was it one of the highlights of the, of the year, you know, in the, in, in the very, very early 60s. And... Um, when you turn around and start to look at situations of today, you'd have to find somebody to go surfing with. Kurumban, you know, go, oh, yeah, we'll go and surf Kurumban. Oh, shit, it looks scary out there today, you know. Right. And, but you'd paddle out anyway, you know, because yeah. you, there'd be a couple of guys that you used to go to high school with that would be like Eddie Sorden and his brother and Bernie Sorden and all these guys out there. And it was like having a huge family just situated in different parts of the Gold Coast. You know, you'd go down there and it was not like today where you've got a mobile phone and you take a photo and go, hey, you guys coming down here, it's bullshit, it's going off. Nobody knew. Right. Nobody knew. You could have four to five foot perfect Corumban right. and no bugger would know because you didn't have a stupid mobile phone that some dickhead around the corners <laughs> talking to about 15 of these mates. But that's what it's about, you know. So And it would have been just about beach tracks then, Let's talk um, about Crum and the, the... Oh, Crum and you didn't have a wall. 
Right. You didn't have the big beach walls. There's another environmental muck-up that we've had on the Gold Coast, as far as I'm concerned. Because in, I, I 